Hi everyone, this is Dr. Erica Pearson of the Pearson Center for Children, and today I'm talking with Kent McLeod. He's an international thought leader and award-winning pharmacist with over 35 years of clinical experience delivering patient-centered health care. His philosophy is to work with every patient individually to ensure they receive the best combination of conventional and natural therapies to achieve optimal health. He's the author of Down Syndrome and Vitamin Therapy, and his new book is titled Biology of the Brain. Today, we discuss the use of vitamins for children and adults with Down syndrome, along with the role that their health, gut health, and gut microbiome play in their overall health and brain health as well. You know, I met Kent about eight years ago at an Autism One conference and have sat down with him and spent collectively many hours discussing how we best help uh, those with Down syndrome using uh, natural therapies, vitamins, etc. And I'm always struck with his open mindedness and his kindness and his thoughtful approach to helping those with Down syndrome. So listen in and hopefully you benefit from our discussion. Thanks. I'm honored to have this opportunity to, um, to have this discussion with you, uh, which I've been wanting to do for years, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure a lot of our uh, you know, followers, let's say, who follow your work and my work um, are really curious to you know, hear what you have to say about the questions um, that I have. So um, I want to start off with, of course, we're going to talk about our uh, patients with Down syndrome first, you know, most, most importantly today. Um, so what, what inspired your work and study of, uh, of helping children and adults with Down syndrome? Oh, I, I, I guess many years ago, a long time ago, I, uh, 30 years ago and now 35 years ago, I, uh, w I was doing, uh, I was compounding for children who had allergies and severe problems. I was kind of go-to uh, problem solver for kids with uh, specific medication needs. And I was the pharmacist that would usually solve them. Sometimes it was uh, allergies to color. Sometimes it was, it was uh, dosage forms for kids that weren't available, you know, suppositories for kids when they're only in uh, nothing available by mouth. So I was, I was very innovative and still am very innovative in solving these problems. And um, a group of parents with children with Down syndrome came to me and they were going to, uh, to Dr. Turkel in Detroit and they were using, uh, you know, Dr. Turkel's formula and uh, they gave me the book, his book on the U series and I thought it was unbelievably well detailed and um, very, very clinical, very, very precise and his, 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 um, his, his observations. I thought it was quite interesting. And the, um, the border was essentially closed. So what was happening was these people could not get this stuff, their vitamins basically shipped across the border. And they asked me my opinion. And I said, well, at that point, he had a number, it was, it was a number of different uh, parts and products. And I said, well, this is good. This is kind of old. This is sort of new. This is, you know, there's a few drugs in there that I didn't think were relevant. And um, I just said, if I was to do this, I would do it this way. And they kind of said, why don't you do it? And I so I did. So I made this vitamin mixture for these, this, I guess, 20 odd families. And again, it was very, you know, in terms of the observations and the outcomes, it was very uh, interesting how, how so many reported such significant benefits, you know, it was really, I had no experience, but all of these parents were reporting things like children talking or weren't talking, significant gains in certain um, milestones they felt were attributed to the vitamins. So I just thought, wow, this is very interesting. I, I just uh, continue to make this available. And for me, it was another product like I would make uh, uh, vitamin formulas or amino acid formulas for children with uh, inborn errors of metabolism. And often I would consult, right? I'm a biochemist. So I would try and always work in that team setting. So I just thought I made a multivitamin formula that was a little more um, modernized and efficient 
for, uh, but ba really based on the Dr. Turkel U series, based on, because I thought he was an am amazing scientist and clinician. And that's how I started, you know? Yeah. And uh, from there, it, it'd be kind of, you know, historically, I was thrown into a uh, kind of controversy right off the bat, you know what I mean? But, you yeah. know, yeah. I, I, you know, like, hey, what are you doing this for these kids for? I said, well, I make multivitamins or nutrient recommendations for all kinds of people. What's wrong? This is very scientific. This is not some, some crazy thing to give vitamins to these kids. So that's right. how we started. Right. Yeah, that's great. Um, and, and Turkel's work, you know, it's great that you mentioned it. I mean, he was, he's really one of the um, pioneers in this work for sure. There were others, but, um, but his work is really admirable for sure. Absolutely. Was, you know, so he was, yeah, I, I was just kind of pleased to actually, you know, and some of the, the some of the people that worked with Turkel called me and were so happy that I was continuing to do some of that Turkel's work, you know, and you know, remember, I went to the University of Toronto in biochemistry, and then I went in the pharmacy. And I remember, you know, the one year of lecture, like, you know, I had all these years of biochemistry, and then we had the nutrition for doctors and pharmacists, and a, a big, you know, a big head honcho, wig, a doctor, and we had two lectures. It was all the, you know, the same lectures that all doctors and pharmacists got at University of Toronto, so the top university in Canada. And he basically came in and said, well, actually, nutrients don't have any role in human health, and you can get everything in your diet, and why didn't you guys, you know, go take a break and go uh, drink beer or something, you know, and that was kind of like, well, you know, I have my hand up crying, you know, I have like four years of chemistry of it here. Let's stop this nonsense, right? Nutrients have a lot to do with human health. But, mm -hmm. you know, so when I was faced with the controversy of doctors saying nutrients aren't useful or helpful, it just to me seemed, yeah, well, I'm dealing with people that basically through, you know, my years of biochemistry in the garbage can. So it was not like a a big shock to me that a bunch of doctors thought the nutrients weren't helpful. Helpful, yeah, yeah. I find it interesting. You know, it's you can't deny that vitamins play a role in the body, right? They're cofactors to enzymes, and um, and nutrient deficiencies uh, occur more, way more frequently, I think, than conventional doctors one know how to recognize. Um, you know, given the lack of nutritional um, education in their in medical schools. Um, and so, yeah, so they definitely occur and they certainly occur in our population of children with, with Down syndrome. I remember for the second lecture, I walked in and, re and pulled about 100 studies and said, well, look, here's, how about let, let's talk about these, let's start, you know, and I said, this is what I did in half an hour. I pulled 100 studies and showed how important key nutrients were in human health. Mm -hmm. So I said, please, like, uh, do you want to have that discussion? You know, so I was already a troublemaker right at the unit, you know, at the university. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we can't, we can't make advances in, you know, in our fields without being, you know, a little bit of troublemakers for sure. Um, well, so let's talk about, the, you know, the controversy behind this, right? So when we're using vitamins, um, you know, for children or adults with Down syndrome, let's talk about the idea and the concept of uh, that some people feel that we're trying to fix, cure, or change, right, these, these children. There's a little bit of a uh, um, um, semantics, I think, issue. Um, and so what would you say would be, is the goal of using vitamin therapy, um, as is the title of your book, one of your books, um, for children with Down syndrome? Well, I, I think there's two issues. The first issue, what is the, um, why does, why would a doctor say, you know, vitamins are not helpful for kids with Down syndrome? So that's the first question. And the second question is, is, you know, what are you trying to do with vitamins? You know what I mean? What are you trying to do with vitamins? So on the, on the first simplistic thing is what are you trying to do with vitamins? I mean, I, I, I was always mesmerized that no, no others, you know, from autism to just children who are not with Down syndrome, who take multivitamins or fish oils, no one would ever claim that they didn't love their children or they didn't care or, you know, all this other stuff. I was mesmerized about how 
it was this, you didn't accept your child the way they were if you gave any other child a multivitamin. And remember, you know, as you said, most children in Canada and the US are deficient in key nutrients. They don't get enough fruits and vegetables. There's always a, it's what we call the, you know, the nutrient gap, right? The gap between what we know is use, you know, required every day and actually what they're actually eating every day. And some of it's, you know, some of it's just, it's, it's just a matter of fact, you know? And then, so that's the one issue is why is it so controversial to give a multivitamin to a kid with Down syndrome when it's not to give a multivitamin to a child who doesn't have Down syndrome? So that was the first thing I found very interesting. Mm -hmm. But the number one issue was, is, was, are you trying to change the cause of controversy was, are you trying to change the IQ of children with Down syndrome? with multivitamins and what is the evidence for that? Mm -hmm. That's the, that's sort of the negative connotation issue. Yeah. Yeah. I, I review that with, you know, when I'm working with uh, my individual families, um, I ask the parents, you know, what their goals are for their child. And for many of them, you know, cognition isn't their primary goal. Um, they just want their child feeling their best, um, comfortable, you know, in their body when, when, when many of the patients I'm working with um, don't feel well for a number of reasons. Um, and so cognition isn't always a goal for, for many of the families that I work with. Um, well, but, the, but it is the elephant in the room. So the elephant in the room is, you know, why are, is, a, is the major Down syndrome society say don't, in Canada and U.S., mm -hmm say, don't give your vitamins or unproven therapies. And I wrote a book, Vitamin Therapy. Mm -hmm. So to get right into it, you know, we have multiple, you know, the gold standard is, of course, a double blind controlled study. So in children without Down syndrome, there has been multiple that, you know, controlled studies, placebo controlled studies that have shown the multivitamins significantly improve IQ. So that's been proven. And that's children without Down syndrome. And that's children without Down syndrome. So of course, it's always was mesmerizing to me because, you know, we had you know, a Turkel on an N of one, right? Looking at individual tracking, we mm -hmm. see significant benefits. I observed and significant benefits when I, when parents reported material, uh, Dr. Ruth Harrell did a study that showed significant benefits. And then after the Harrell study, there was three studies, small but controlled studies that show that multivitamins had no benefit to IQ in children with Down syndrome, which kind of created the controversy, which kind of didn't make sense, right? To me, and I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a, like a researcher of IQ, I just, thought, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me when every other child without Down syndrome is proved nutrients have been proven to be effective. We know that nutrient deficiencies are more common biochemically uh, through the digestive system and genetically there are altered requirements for nutrients mm -hmm. and the brain is very sensitive to nutrition. It did not ever make sense to me why there was negative studies. But again, I would just say, well, okay, may, may not improve IQ, but for overall general health, you know, why it's not a big deal to take multivitamins. Yeah. yeah. But recently, as we discussed, the kind of the uh, aha moment came when we realized the fundamental flaw of these existing studies in children with IQ. So these other studies had a fundamental flaw that would mean that no, no study using their methodology, whatever show increases in IQ of anything, basically. Right, right. And so, um, so you know, speaking back to IQ, uh, what I was, um, when I mentioned getting children just feeling better in their body, sleeping better, digesting better, to me, the cognition often just follows with that. I mean, with anybody, uh, I know when I'm not sleeping well, or if my digestion is off, or, you know, I can't, my, you know, our thinking is, is muddled. Um, and so just by working on the physical 
health of the body, to me, the brain often follows because the brain is a physical organ of the body. I, I, my, I agree with you, and I've had those dis- I've had to have those discussions for years. But now we know that the that the rating scale for IQ that was used in those studies was fundamentally not correct. They right. need children with Down syndrome need their own rating scale to yeah. catch the kind of IQ to to, yeah. to study if if an intervention of any type improves cognition. Yeah. That's just the truth. And so we, you, have to fun, you have to disregard any studies in Down syndrome that use traditional IQ tests that were not yeah. designed for a child with Down syndrome. So yeah. absolutely, you're right. But it's kind of like aha, you know, when, an aha moment. And this rating scale, the Arizona rating scale, wasn't designed for nutrients. It was designed because some drug companies we're looking at drugs in Down syndrome, and they immediately f- spotted the problem with base IQ testing, which is this floor effect, which is like, aha, oh my God, you know, how, you know, and I'm a little upset because any, any person who measured IQ would have seen that in the study, would have meant this, they would have observed that the study was flawed, but you know what, they, they did not, Ray, you know, they just were more interested in proving sort of negatively, which often happens in nutrients. Like yeah. nobody wants to find out that vitamins could be helpful. Right. Yeah, absolutely. There's no money in that. The the other thing, so the, so the IQ testing, I think many of the viewers of this, parents, um, many of my really you know, uh, involved parents in the education of children with Down syndrome um, recognize, yeah, the IQ testing is um, as it's traditionally done is not, you know, often valid for children with Down syndrome, that they do require yeah. a little bit of a different, different look at, at, at their, at their uh, IQ. Um, I remember so- Turkel in, in his formulas put thyroglobulin in every, so every child got thyroid, you know, yeah. so, you know, I took it out because it was a, you know, a prescription and I didn't, I thought, well, this should be inv- individualized. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, you know, how many years do you and I know still? I mean, it's changed a lot. Mm-hmm. But have we struggled with giving thyroid to children with Down syndrome who are overtly low in thyroid mm-hmm. when it's like not even questionably proven that low thyroid will affect brain development and cognition? It's so, bad. you know what I mean? It's kind of like... Yeah. So when I, you know, even the, the U series of Dr. Turkel, he gave every child a yeah. baseline dose of thyroid. I think it was, I, I think the paper I read was actually of T3 hormone. Yeah, thyroglobulin, yes. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, so that, yeah, was obviously very interesting to me because I've done, you know, a fair amount of work with thyroid hormone with children um, when warranted, looking at it a little bit differently. Um, so, so talking about this history, um, I want to talk about um, how your thinking about vitamin therapy has changed. Because I'm sure the formula that you talk about that you created 30 years ago has changed over the years. Um, talk to me about that process of yeah. It's so your thinking changed. Yeah. You know, so one of the things I did was develop, uh, and you know, and and again, I, I'm thankful for Down syndrome because I thought, well one of the ways as a, being a chemist and I'm going to solve this controversy is just measure nutrients and that of people that come to me. So why are you arguing with me? If, you know, if your iron is low, you don't need to say, I, you know, argue that, that you you could get in your diet, your iron is low in your blood, therefore you need it. You know what I mean? It's right. I sort of wanted to just cut it, cut the controversy off at the knees. So I, I started measuring nutrients, you know, I built my own nutrient laboratory as a chemist to actually measure things. So I thought that would just stop all the, the nonsense and the controversy. Um, so a few observations. First of all, you know, traditional doctors or medical doctors from, like who threw nutrients in the garbage can in one lecture weren't interested on in measuring nutrients anyhow. You know, it's like vitamin D. You still have to pull and scrap you know where i live in canada i've never measured a a vitamin d that was optimal 
ever in summer and winter. And yet I, I still for, you know, even measuring vitamin D, I would be dealing mainly every day that I was hurting people by giving them vitamin D when they're overtly deficient for many years. You know what I mean? So the measurement was, was good, but I still had the, the educational component that was still frustrating. Mm -hmm. But the, the issue in, in Down syndrome was, was that I observed that, yes, they, they were low in nutrients, but they also had significant variation in the requirements of nutrients. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't just like one size fits all. So it was good to give a baseline nutrient, but it was not kind of like, um, it wasn't kind of like, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, like everything works all the time. And, and I observed that, frankly, in many other people. And just like iron, why did I have to give this person 30 milligrams of the iron and this person 100 milligrams of iron? And this person with 200 milligrams of iron, I couldn't get their iron levels up, right? So what is the... What's, what is missing is it, you know, and I, I was very sophisticated in my selection of, of nutrients according to what I knew. I mean, I talked previously about, I did a, a whole paper on iron absorption and chemistry at the University of Toronto. I mean, I thought I knew everything about iron, yeah. yet there is still something that I wasn't understanding. Mm -hmm. It was you know, how different nutrients were absorbed and handled. So, yeah, so my evolution with nutrients with Down syndrome was that, uh, like, why is it controversial to give a base multivitamin? Mm -hmm. And beyond that, it, there's a lot more going on than, that, than you can imagine, whether it's thyroid, the genetics, and what else is affecting the absorption of nutrients that make such variations. Okay. Yeah, I, I like that you, uh, obviously, that you talk about the individual needs and the, the use of a base multivitamin. I've, um, for years, I prefer using what I consider just a base multivitamin that I can add to and adjust and change. Um, and I mean, we could talk about individual nutrients, but yeah, things like iron, kids need at different levels. Zinc, children will need at different levels. Um, and it, it, in my experience, testing is the best way to find out, as you've experienced as well, um, to see exactly what a child needs. And in Down syndrome, we know that there are tendency, I call them tendencies towards these deficiencies. Yeah. Um, and, if, and if a parent can't access these tests, if they have a physician who won't do it, or they're in another you know, country, um, not Canada, not the United States, where a they don't have access to these tests. Yeah, at least a base multivitamin can be helpful. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, but then you also, I love that you allude to the, the cause of the deficiencies, right? Um, this is one thing I teach parents often, you know, before we even move forward is I kind of teach them a little bit about what we're about to do, you know? And I say, whenever we find a deficiency, yes, we should give the nutrient and address it, but let's do, a, if you want to, or let's do a little bit more digging to figure out why that deficiency is there. And in my experience, malabsorption is a big, um, a big issue in this population of... I, I agree. Yeah, yes. yeah. Um, and, and there are some, there aren't enough studies, I, I don't think, looking at malabsorption. There are some case reports and some case series reports, but... Um, but, but even the ones that were done were, were bought, what I mean by bias, you know, when I dug into some of the, I mean, a vitamin A study, the, the literature actually showed different handling of vitamin A in the study in Down syndrome, but the outcome was, oh, children with Down syndrome have no differences. You're going, but no, your study actually showed differences, but you didn't, you wanted to say at the end of the, you know, yeah. it was, it's very bizarre, some of the uh, you know, uh, uh, wa the, the backflips that medicine would go to mm -hmm. to not see these differences or not give a multivitamin or yeah. a, like vitamin A or zinc yeah. or something to, to someone. I, it's very bizarre. I find. Yeah, we, I, I think it's important that we use uh, a lot of critical thinking and um, not a skeptical eye, but definitely some critical analyses when we're looking at research. Um, just because there's a conclusion within a research, you know, we have to um, question that sometimes. Um, I'll even see from sentence to sentence, they'll, you know, they might say, I mean, this is really paraphrasing, let's say zinc, you know, tends to be low in children with Down syndrome. And the next sentence, it'll say, therefore, 
trisomy 21 causes zinc deficiency. And I get frustrated with that because it negates any other causes of that zinc deficiency, like malabsorption, um, you know, other, you know, gastrointestinal inflammation can, you know, hypochlorhydria can cause zinc deficiency. It just be, because there is a zinc deficiency in a group of children with Down syndrome, it must be because of, must be because of their Down syndrome. And it stops any potential um, help for these children where we look at, you know, some other causes. So, um, so that- and, and, you know, it, there is an innate bias as well. I mean, what happens is I believe the nutrients that the science is clear that nutrients help and children with Down syndrome. So when I get a negative study or something, I, I, I go a little deeper, right? So I'm going, well, that's not what I see and that's not what I experience. Right. And then often you will you know, look for flaws. So if you come to this field with a bias that nutrients aren't helpful for kids, then you, you you don't need to read any further. You don't need to go underneath it. You know, if and see, zinc is uh, well. Maybe there's some zinc deficiency, but why why is this child needs some and this child doesn't need some? Why is this? You know, to me, it's you. If you think the nutrients are effective, which the evidence is, by the way, then you actually start unraveling the mysteries behind these things. If you think food is irrelevant to human health. You don't need to. You you have to abandon. You have, you get to abandon the whole field, right, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, this is true for any topic. When we're looking to support our beliefs, we will find exactly. and article things to support our beliefs. But if we use more of a critical thinking, learning, questioning our own. I mean, I think it's really important, as we talked about before this. You know, the the importance of failure questioning our beliefs and really, um, you know, just asking these important questions and using some critical thinking and not just following one line of, of thought. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, most, most nutrients or pe people in the, how shall I say it, people get into trouble or companies mm -hmm. get into non-professionals, get into trouble with claims, right? It's one thing I could, we, you and I could claim that nutrients are important for human health and that if someone is low in a nutrient, it may help their, their immune system, their overall health. It may, you know, but, but we, we may, we cannot claim that a multivitamin can help with cognition and Down syndrome because it's not proven yet. You know, and we can say that about thyroid, but we can absolutely claim that nutrients are really important for health and Down syndrome. That's a, that's a that's a reasonable claim yeah. based on the literature. So you know, it, and and it's it's sometimes um, hard for people to discern the that 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 difference. You know. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, so let me move move into some more questions here. Um, so, well, I had a question here. Is there one formula that you feel will, will work for everyone with Down syndrome? I think we've already answered that. There's a, a base. No, I mean, obviously, you know, I think more the current formula is I do more work. If you're not living under a rock, you're doing more work on the microbiome, right? I just wrote a book on the microbiome in the brain. But if you're not living under a rock, you realize that some of these issues that may be relevant in Down syndrome are alterations in the microbiome, which affect the absorption of nutrients, right? So, so you know, clearly these things are, are quite relevant, you know, to, to all these alterations. So my current formula is more um, cognizant of microbiome shifts. You know what I mean? I'm more, yes. okay, so I'm kind of going, oh, so, uh, you know, a B6 to me is very fascinating. You know, in nature, um, you know, vitamin B6 is only found in the pyridoxal form, but it has mm -hmm. to be phosphorylated in the gut to actually to be activated. So it's, now what is altering? We know what is happening there. We know B6 is helpful in anxiety and depression in women. Women have more, more 
troubles with activating B6. And that was published in a journal of, uh, in a American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. So is the microbiome one of the missing pieces in, in how people respond to B6? And are we using the right form? So, you know, more subtleness around, you know, your, your nutrient selection, trying to armor the, in the body from having to require these nutrients to be activated in the gut. So that's kind of where, yeah. you know, I, I evolved from, you know, old school Turk, um, Harold mm -hmm. and Turkel was just giving massive doses of vitamins, which we had a lot of adverse effects with. Yes, right. Let's talk about that. Um, and yeah. I, I think the microbiome information was, you know, missing many years ago. Exactly. Um, so the, the interaction, what concerns me, and where we do a lot of work too, is looking at the interaction of these nutrients and vitamins with the microbiome, because everything you put in the mouth in our mouth or the mouth of any patient or a child is absolutely going to impact their microbiome. Exactly. Sometimes to in, sometimes in a negative way. Um, yes. Because those bacteria are using those nutrients and thriving on those nutrients um, just as much as our body is. And for example, I think a child with with SIBO or some sort of path, you know small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or some sort of pathogenic bacteria adding lots of nutrients like that can aggravate and make that child feel worse. Yeah. You're absolutely right. So that's starting to make sense, right? Because, you know, one of the classic examples was iron, right? What happens to iron that's not absorbed? Well, you're going to create all this gastrointestinal, yeah. like fertilizer yeah. that grows all kinds of very procure, very unique bacteria that can thrive on iron. So it changes the whole structure yeah. the microbiome and that may be true with every other nutrient but we didn't understand mm -hmm. we you know when i say adverse effects we what's going on why why is something that we you know would create a behavioral effect or uh, then we, we we there's no mechanism or awareness of that but that would be tr absolutely true mm -hmm. in high dose nutrients so again mine became more conservative mm -hmm. over time the, mm -hmm you know, from the kind of like the Harrell orientation. Because again, back in the, those days, I, I used, once Harrell came out with her stuff, I kind of used Turkel and Harrell who, and Dr. Ruth Harrell. Again, a very, very, very uh, detailed clinician. Like she was quite a remarkable woman, but she used, you know, um, you know, 3,000 milligrams of vitamin C, 1,500 milligrams of niacinamide, 200 milligrams of thought, like these yeah. big doses of nutrients. And I just found no, not many kids could tolerate these without gastrointestinal or other effects. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's kind of how I kind of yeah. became more conservative. Yeah. yeah. I, I, you know, I'll, I'll admit I've, I've certainly used some fairly high doses of uh, particularly B1 and B2 in some of my patients mm -hmm. in the 100 yeah. milligram doses when warranted, right? When testing, in, and I, I look at everything, testing, symptoms, and uh, not only do we work up to these 100 milligram plus doses, you know, we're looking, we're working on the underlying. But you're not doing it for every person, uh, like right out of the gate. 100%, yeah, 100%. And, and you know, legitimately, that's kind of where you're going you know, should you just give everybody a big dose of everything and then, you know, and then no. deal with the consequences. That was kind of old school. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So iron, for example, to speak specifically about that and the microbiome um, so that, you know, again, viewers have some sort of reference. Um, Klebsiella pneumoniae is a big iron consumer um, and it can be a cause of an iron deficiency. And so when I see an iron deficiency in a child who has sufficient, you know, iron in their diet, I have to go, ooh, do I just give this kid iron? Or I'm worried if this is, you know, and Klebsiella pneumonia is a histamine producing bacteria, it can trigger autoimmune conditions. And I have, ooh, am I gonna feed this Klebs? So I wanna do a stool analysis. I wanna run all these tests that aren't always possible, but, but at the end of the day, a low iron can contribute. But, but, but you're, you're, you're beginning, you're, you, what you're doing is beginning the notion that you really shouldn't be, that that piece of understanding the microbiome should be considered with anything that you stick in your mouth. Right. 
yeah. from a drug or even nutrient point of view. I mean, that'll be the future, right? To understand how how mm -hmm. different things affect your microbiome. I think that's, yeah. that's you know, whereas now it's not a consideration for 99% of, uh, of the healthcare practitioners in the world. Right, right, right. I think the, you know, not looking for nutrient deficiencies and when they're found, just giving the nutrient and calling it a day. Yeah, uh, no, really that's, important that's, that there's a lot of information that you actually get, mm -hmm. you know, and, and going to point of failure, right? Like, do you just give it and then say like drugs? Oh, I, you can't tolerate fiber. You can't tolerate iron. You can't tolerate X. Or do you actually find out, you know, why right. you can't tolerate those things? Yeah. That's, that's actually where the actual uh, real advances occur. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Always, you know, we always ask in our office, you know, what else? What else? You know, if we find something, yeah. what else? Yeah. Um, so, so you do have a new formula out, I mean, newer than uh, than the MSB formula, and it's the MS the Neuro Plus. Yep. Can you talk a little bit about how that's different and what prompted that? Again, I, I just put a bit of uh, curcumin in it. I like, and again, curcumin again going to, out of interest, right? So, um, I like curcumin, so I put a little bit of curcumin. I mean, again, why am I doing it? Because it's of its influence. Not in, it has evidence in the brain, but I'm interested, I believe that the evidence is pointing to what it's doing in the gut, maybe actually influencing the brain. And it's actually very interesting, you know, many companies are going, oh, our curcumin is well absorbed, you know, so it's, therefore it's the best one, right? And I'm going, you have no, the, the company I'm using is one that's done the literature and published on how it improves brain function, this BPM curcumin. And it may not be absorbed at all. I don't care about its absorption. It may be influenced in the brain by what it's doing in the microbiome. In the gut. Right? So it's kind of like, you know, going to your first point, unless if, if you don't know what the drug is doing, just assuming the drug or herb or nutrient is good because it's absorbed in the body, may not, ought not actually be relevant. It may be what it's doing in the, mic, in the gut that's yeah. improving the brain. Yeah. So I, I've done that, pyridoxal 5-phosphate, all the active folates. It's just a cleaner, a cleaner formula, you know, that's more conservative, mm -hmm. you know, more, you know, um, uh, glutathione that has evidence. It's just yeah. cleaner and conservative yeah. that we use more of a base with, you know, it's not a, you know, I'm not trying to do everything in, in a kitchen sink with that. Okay. That's all. Yeah, we, we use that term a lot, the kitchen sink approach. It's something we don't, you know, we don't uh, tend to, to use for sure in our office. Um, I like that it, that it has benfotiamine and I'm a huge fan. Yeah, then from, again, yeah. we're going to try and insulate yeah. absorption, right? So benfotiamine we know has some better absorptive capacity. So I'm trying to I'm trying to bypass any gut-based absorptive issues when there's a nutrient that has better absorption characteristics. So like amphotiamine versus thiamine. So that's, yeah, I agree. And then what about the idea that, so it does have a little bit of copper in it. Let's talk about that, you know, within the vitamin, you know, that's a little controversial. And, and you know, look, I'm, I'll just start out by saying I'm, I believe that, you know, copper is needed to balance zinc and that we shouldn't always you know, just give zinc and not, and copper is poison to children with Down syndrome. We, uh, sorry, I've asked you the question, but I just want to say that we have found that a copper deficiency in a number of children with Down syndrome. And so tell me, talk to me about your experience with zinc and copper. You know, I, I think, I, th I think always with, with the public, they want to try and simplify something, copper good, copper bad. Yeah. yeah. From the get-go, when I was making formulas in the hospitals mm -hmm. 40 years ago, what was established that there is a relationship between zinc and copper, and that I, it would, I would be considered, I, I, I would, it would be a medical error mm -hmm. for me to give zinc without giving copper, right? It was a medical error. I would actually, I could lose my license if I was not doing lean with that issue that was... Mm -hmm. proven to be related so mm -hmm. now we get into simplistic views of the brain in terms of copper toxicity causes mm -hmm. alzheimer's now 
absolutely copper in excess can cause brain damage just like you know originally we thought it was zinc that that, that was causing plaques mm -hmm. in you know alzheimer's disease now we're much more aware that it's an inflammatory cascade and that there's it's an in, you know alzheimer's and even in in down syndrome and non down syndrome is a is an inflammatory brain disorder mm -hmm. and it has multiple factorial issues mm -hmm. of which copper is not necessarily the issue so again i i kind of i sometimes i've i knew when i put copper in a vitamin i was always going to deal with people going oh you have copper in your vitamin are you don't you know that cop i said i've been looking at this stuff for 40 years do you know that i'm still like 40 years ago i had to manage you know total parental nutrition in kids in adults and if i didn't put copper with zinc i that would be a mistake yeah, you know yeah yeah, yeah so I, I think frustrating I think... to deal with this but now we know i get to say no of course you could have too much, of course, but it is an artifact, I believe. Mm -hmm. The evidence is showing just like zinc was or whatever. And of course, you can have too much of this. You know, I had a, a client the other day and it was very weird, I, you know, because of it, bad, you know, who had a copper seven IUD that got toxic on copper, but it was from something you could actually identify mm -hmm. as some that caused it. Is that, is that a fair answer to this question? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, absolutely. And I think getting back to um, the gut and the microbiome, one of my favorite topics of talking about the gut is bile, right? Um, and the way the body excretes excess copper should be investigated, and that's through bile, right? And so if I have a child with an elevated copper level, I don't say, oh, let's just give a bunch of zinc and avoid copper. Again, the why question. I have to look at their their whole picture and say, is this because of a gallstone or sludgy bile or? Um, or and, bile? And I and I agree. I think it's, it's the bile thing is has been in hiding in plain sight, really. And I think that you know I deal with a lot of women with hormonal issues and yeah, men, you know, and and it's huge in this, right? And cortisol and their stress response, you know, the the actual liver issues are it's. Again, it's huge. It's actually when you look at the literature in non-alcoholic fatty livers and metabolic syndrome and all the liver issues, it's a monster. It's actually, you know, I'm surprised we're not hearing more about it. And so actually the, the, the relationship to, to excretion of drugs and nutrients and hormone balance and who is is and microbiome my bile is a tremendous you uh, antibacterial antifungal so when you're in you know so when you're dealing with you know SIBO everywhere is it you know you have to look at bile as being a, is it a is it really SIBO problem or a liver inadequacy problem mm -hmm. yeah you know? absolutely I, I, some of my colleagues some of my colleagues treat all of their patients with SIBO they they treat their gallbladder whether yeah. they have an obvious you know problem or not you know maybe um, that would be more obvious is more universal with the way we've been eating and the loads on our liver than everyone all of a sudden having a in you know a SIBO issue SIBO is has to be involved with you know if, uh, transit time there has to be something messing up but or bile like where what is the under if you're going to look for or both. Under, or both right if something's underneath this it's more likely the liver than than anything else if you're yeah. going to guess at something without you know testing and looking deeper right yeah and and the production of bile um i think it's important to recognize is a very methylation heavy dependent process you know phosphatidylcholine being a huge draw in methylation so i can you know very easily see how a child with down syndrome if there were some methylation issues um, could have, you know, therefore bile and gallbladder issues. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And then you have the genetics, right? The genetics, uh, so the, the genetic vari individual variations on the PEMT gene, right? PEMT, The yeah. phosphatidylethanolamine methyl transferase, a nice mouthful. But anyhow, that is a highly, you know, that process is highly methylation dependent. Mm -hmm. and, and yet there's genetic variations within Down syndrome that affect that. So all of a sudden you have, you can have like a, 
a double whammy and that's you know a, you know that's that's hard to understand as well that, that you can have all the other you can have other genetics that nobody knows about you know i mean the choline issue is you know choline is the number one probably one or two deficiency in the in the diet right then you have the gen, you know the genetics of that and then you have the metabolic issues around that so it's a big issue if you know and so often you're just people aren't aware of choline being deficient being a top deficiency in the diet let alone the subtlety around it so it's kind of a frustrating conversation right yeah, choline, choline is is huge as you know it's one of my if i were to pick one nutrient which is tricky that i would give to all children with down syndrome it would be probably phosphatidylcholine um, yeah so i tried in the in the in the new methyl you know in the new formula i tried to put as much choline nice. in it without you know what happens into these when you make a multivitamin right as soon as you burden the multivitamin with one nutrient you know, all of a sudden people go, oh, I don't want to take so many vitamins. And then, so you're like, you're, you're always, um, it's, a, it's, you know, it's better than nothing, but it's not ideal. You know, like, as you say, if there's not enough choline in the diet, which only comes from egg yolks, mm -hmm. then yeah. you yeah. have to supplement choline, period. Absolutely. And again, the microbiome is at play here when, when, you know, uh, phosphatidylcholine um, interacting with elevated levels of bacteria in the gut can create a compound called TMAO. Um, I don't know what it stands for exactly. I did at one point. Trimethylamine. Trimethylamine, yeah. And it has a fishy odor to it. Yeah. Um, and I think it's been linked to heart disease. And so, so any nutrient, you have to be careful, you know, taking into consideration the microbiome. But again, you know, there's intra, you know, this could be evolved in absorption. And again, one of the things on my list to do, it, it would be a good test to actually do a, to do a choline level in the blood versus TMAO, right? You can actually, I think you, if you could, um, you, you could see how that is being absorbed. And I think that would be a very big deal because without a healthy microbiome, you give choline, you'll get all this conversion to TMAO. Mm -hmm. I was using a high absorb like a very, very, very pure choline to see. Um, but, and I was actually contacted the, uh, the, the, the researcher that has a lab, I think he's in Cleveland, that did the TMAO work. Oh, nice. And I said, well, why don't I, you know, why don't you do a choline TMAO level? Mm -hmm. Like you're just going after TMAO. You're, you're really not, you know, he's, he's not assessing the microbiome in that. Right, right. But you're right. It's it, you know it's confusing, right? So it, the 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 main researcher that published all the choline work, this Zeisel, out of Harvard, actually did a whole re, you know a whole article and rebuttal on how crucial choline is versus any of these so-called risks associated with TMAO in the heart. So again, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, but individual. I think is the is is the key point. Individual again. I mean, I, I I avoid the issue by doing doing improvements in gut health. I think it's it's a big deal. Yeah, absolutely. So so all of this. So we're we're talking a lot about the gut and microbiome. Yet we're talking about you know children with Down syndrome and and an extra chromosome. How much? This is a really big question. How much of of the health of a child with Down syndrome do you think is dependent on the extra chromosome versus environment, microbiome, diet, right? I mean, it's more of a philosophical question than a, you know, either or. Well, you know, again, you know, if you, you, if you look at children who don't have Down syndrome, we, we've clearly established mm -hmm. that the environment is crucial yeah. to brain development. Like it's not the stimulation of the brain, the environment, it's mm -hmm. crucial. It's not controversial. It's in fact one of the biggest important yeah. revelations of how important it is in societies or advanced countries to 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 give a lot of support to mm -hmm. children because the developing brain, you know, is so fra is so fragile in development and any environmental abuse or adverse conditions affects cognition behavior, 
function forever. So it's not, and, and, and again, it's not controversial. So a great environment for these kids has a tremendous impact. It is not confusing. Mm -hmm. That being said, a great biological environment is also proven to be healthy for the brain and the body's development. So again, it's, it's not a nature or nurture argument. They right. both have chemical and biological changes. A yeah. child that is, has a nurturing, a nurturing environment, mm -hmm. their brain looks different than a child that has been suffering with an ad adverse childhood experiences during development. It's, mm -hmm. The brain has less of, a, of these beautiful neurons. Mm -hmm. So nutrients are proven like choline, as you said, choline, you know, in every animal study, every animal, 20, 30 studies, maternal choline levels has proven mm -hmm. to affect cognition of the unborn fetus forever, forever. It's mm -hmm. so well proven that it would be unethical to deprive a human of choline to see if it, the brain wasn't functioning, right? right? So yeah. it's not near either or. You, you, a great environment includes optimal nutrition and optimal stimulation. It makes a huge difference. Yeah, absolutely. The, um, yeah, you mentioned the, the studies of like with the withholding choline, um, Barbara Strupp um, from Cornell University, I think she's done a lot of maternal choline studies and, and Down syndrome. And I think she's mostly studied mice. Um, yeah. She approached me and asked me to, you know, put together some patients and have a control group and a, and a study group. And I said, I'm not going to do that. I'm not no, going to not. It would be unethical. It, it would I, be unethical yeah. to, yeah. to withhold so choline said, from yeah. a mother. That's, it's well right. proven. But right. that, so you know, on the other side, how yeah. come everyone doesn't know that it's well established that choline, in fact, there was, I forget her name. I was at a conference. She was working with Zizel. She wanted to increase the maternal choline you know, you know, for young women to a childbearing age to increase choline requirements to a thousand, like 900 to a thousand milligrams a day. Yeah. 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 I don't think that's, I don't think that's uncalled for. Exactly. Yeah. Let alone what's the average now, right? It's like hundred milligrams. Right. Right. It's, it's low for sure. Um, so, Right, so so this all kind of leads up to your new book, which is uh, really great. I'm excited to dive into a little bit uh, more myself. Um, so the the if you could briefly explain, although there's a lot to say here, um, how the microbes in the gut can directly and not even indirectly, but how they can directly impact uh, brain health. Well, I mean, the these there's more, like we know seven or eight direct pathways. I mean, one of the most direct pathways is the vagus nerve, right? It's a, the 401 highway linking your gut to your brain or the major highway, the, the uh, 12 lane highway. So we all know that, that, you know, if we're anxious, we could feel it in our gut, feel sick in our stomach, but it goes the other way too. You know, if you have unhealthy microbes in your stomach, it can create anxiety in your brain. Um, the biggest correlation, for example, if they just went to, in a journal, they just did, went to uh, a number of gastroenterology clinics where everyone was there for a, a, a GI problem from, you know, IBS to, um, you know, uh, irritable bowel syndrome to inflammatory bowel disease and did anxiety questionnaires, 90, and depression questionnaires. Of these 4,000 patients, 90% scored over the top on anxiety questionnaires, and 87% yeah. were depressed. And kind of like the big conclusion was, hello, you know, how come we aren't looking at these things, you know? Right. right. Now, the mechanisms underneath that go from the direct pathway to bacteria literally influencing neurotransmitters, Mm -hmm. influencing the actual absorption of neurotransmitters in the brain, um, different hormone signals, just all the you know, cytokine signaling systems, mm -hmm. all the absorptive things, right? We mentioned all the absorptive pathways, um, hormone balance, how they affect hormone metabolism. So it's, and those are just, you know, 
things we know, and then there's subsets of all those different issues. So the impact is dramatic. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, in my bubble of colleagues and, and you know, yourself included, I don't think we can talk about brain health without talking about the gut. No. It's just no. so linked. And the, the, the growing body of research, the massive growing body of research connecting the microbiome and the, and, and the gut and brain health is, um, is impressive. And, and I, I spoke more. to the I spoke to the main addiction conference of Canada, like the you know substance use disorder conference a year ago, and on the microbiome as a target in addictions, mm -hmm. and I presented all these cases, you know, and that it was not just me; it was like whole scientific, you know, the proceedings of the National Academy of Science. These groups have all already established. This is a target. And then they gave real case studies of how dramatically it can alter um, alcohol use disorders, opioid use disorders in my, you know, so it was like, guys, like, why aren't you all over this? You know, when you drink or you're on opioids, they all, every individual has stomach problems, but there's actually healing those problems influences behavior. That, that doesn't make sense, right? They were hard to get their head around. No, we need more study. I go, well, studies, we have thousands of studies and our treatments in mental health, these mental health issues are terrible. We're still doing the same things that we did 40 years ago when I graduated that don't work very well. Right. Yeah, absolutely. It kind of links back to a little bit of what I said earlier about how if we just get gut health optimal, even if cognition isn't necessarily a goal for a parent, it can ha it can happen. It can follow, um, and their behavior and their mood and their exactly behavior, mood. I mean, sometimes I I don't, you know, it's almost like why do you know, going to someone with a substance use disorder, and it's good to talk about it because it's so clear, right? Someone who's killing themselves with alcohol, mm -hmm. and I'm and I go well, and but their 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 stomach is a complete mess, right? They can't really do anything. I said, well, wouldn't it be Let's not worry about the alcohol. Let's, how would you, let's just see what happens if your gut was completely better. When, isn't that a goal in itself? Right. Oh, right. by the way, watch what happens to your mood, your alcohol consumption, yeah. and, oh, by the way. So it's sometimes, why do I have to talk people into this when, when the outcome of just feeling, having a healthy gut is so nice? Yeah, yeah. And what would you say, you know, again, with, with parents watching, you know, with gut health being so important, um, what would you say is the, I don't know, the biggest, most important approach to helping a child, let's say specifically with Down syndrome and optimizing their, their gut health? Well, you know, Topic. Yeah. you know, I mean, obviously, you, in a simplistic way, prebiotics and, and probiotics, yeah. right? So prebiotics mm -hmm. are essentially uh, soluble fibers and polyphenolic fibers, mm -hmm. which I love mm -hmm. in terms of improving, you know, tight junctions. They actually improve the immune system. They regulate blood sugar levels. So if, and, and often sometimes I do that, I just say, well, here, take this combination prebiotic probiotic I made. I made um, a product that has a combination of uh, xylo, oligosaccharides and neuringin and hesperidin, like really, so like all together, nice. take a bunch of this and tell me how you're due, you know, nice. quietly. And if they have, you know, more bloating or gas or problems, it may expose some SIBO, or, you know what I mean? So, yeah. so, soluble, so expose some issues, but if they can tolerate it and there's no problem, yeah. there you go, right? Yeah. Yeah, feeding those, those healthy bacteria and, you know, getting our children, some children to eat vegetables and healthy fibers can be, can be tricky. But what happens when a child then eats less and less of these healthy fibers, they get kind of more gastrointestinal issues, as I see it, more kind of malabsorption issues, and then they get more picky eating and you get into a little bit of a vicious cycle. Um, particularly in, you know, in the area of zinc deficiency will create some picky eating and changes in appetite. Um, and so it, it's, it's difficult to kind of back step out of that situation, that vicious cycle. Um, but it, it, to me, it starts with, with, yeah, diet and vegetables. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think it's just as crucial 
it should be a crucial requirement of any intake because the evidence is so overwhelming. You know, always we get this, uh, you can get it in your diet. And that's true. Uh, but it should be actually, the fiber gap should be analyzed in, by any health practitioner. And, and, you know, again, the evidence for that would be, you know, if it's not Down syndrome, a car, you know, heart attack and stroke. Number one killer, right. British Medical Journal, meta-analysis says that, you know, you, the number of deaths that you would save with soluble fiber, prebiotic fiber, Mm. is basically about 20 times better results than any of the results we've got with statin drugs Interesting. in preventing heart attack and stroke, right? Yeah. yeah. In uncomplicated, you know, prevention studies. Yeah. That's remarkable, 20 times. So if someone comes in and says, wow, this, I can get it in my diet, and you analyze their diet, and they're not getting any, I mean, right. it's, you know, the, in Canada, the, the male requirement is 38 grams a day of soluble fiber. You know, a pair is four grams. You know, it's hard to get to that 38. Mm -hmm. but why wouldn't that be an essential assessment of your actual intake right. of fiber versus what's recommended? Right. And then you, you fill in the gaps with supplemental product, right? So I don't disagree that fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, you know, which is another topic, right, aren't essential, but it should be an essential assessment so that people even know how much is there required and how much they're missing. And that's so important because think about it. And, you know, the evidence is mounting that inflammatory bowel, you know, the brain is an inf issue, is an inflammatory issue where the gut is intimately involved in regulating inflammation in the brain. And, you know, you have, met, so here we have, right, the gut, methylation, you know, and oxidative stress. I thought, ox, you know, that's kind of the trifecta of, of issues that we can mod modulate. Yeah. And yeah. the gut is intimate to that inflammatory disorder. Yeah. All, and, and they're all connected with one another. They're not separate. Yeah. yeah. They're connected to one another. So, um Gosh, we've we've gone off track, but we mentioned we mentioned methylation. Methylation. So, um, can you tell us uh, briefly again, I guess, um, about methylation, how it might be impacted in Down syndrome? Since we've we've mentioned it a couple of times, um, you know the how the extra chromosome might impact methylation, and if it's the same in every child with Down syndrome. Well, I, I think again, you know, I mean, what, what what's the drain of methylation, right? Is there it's the oxidative stress is a drain. So there's like to recycle glutathione, that step is highly, highly uh, methylation dependent. So that, that's a, you know, there's just different drains on methylation. And just methylation is the way I explain is just like the finishing carpenter in a house. You know, it's like going into a house and, you know, it looks great but there's no handles on the doors, you know, the, there's nothing to flush the toilet with, everything's good, you know, all the, all the little key, all the little, the keys don't work in the lock, it's all the pieces that make the house work, that's what methylation is, and so the, it just, and there's a whole, and the body has an amazing amount of genes and nutrients that all can support methylation, it's always all these backups, but if you have you know, if you're missing, you know, some of the key backups are folic acid, B12, choline. Those are your kind of your, you know, and glutathione is intimate. So all these things are all like cycling together. So any one of them that's, that's knocked to its knees can put pressure when there's a, you know, when there's external pressure like Down syndrome on that process. That's all there is to it, really. Yeah. Nice. I've, um, I've recently been testing histamine levels in many of my patients, and I, I routinely test it now because we're finding histamine levels really high um, in blood levels in many, but not all of our children, especially the ones with, you know, uh, more significant gastrointestinal issues. And the clearing of the body's attempt to clear histamine from the body is another kind of uh. key draw on methylate histamine methyltransferase clear as histamine. Um, so just, you know, another example that can differ based on the microbiome of a child. Um, and the other one, the other um, key nutrient here too that I really appreciated was in MSV was your addition of creatine. 
right, which I've always quoted as being the largest draw on methylation, more than all other processes alone is the production of creatine within the body. So again, you know, I spent a lot of time on creatine. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I think it's another supportive nutrient that can be helpful. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I, I th not too much. You, you never want to kind of downplay one thing or the other, but I think there's all these backup systems, you know, even the one gene, you know, when you look at the, all, so many genes that are, are can upregulate to try and help when methylation is defective. But, but like you said, the microbiome, I think, is, is something that's tremendously, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's another backup mechanism that can really help with these things. So, yeah. 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 Um, so, so we've been talking for about an hour here. I'm going to, you know, close out with some other key ideas. Um, again, with parents listening, we're talking about a lot of nutrients and, you know, philosophies and ideas here. Are there any like interventions or tips, maybe top three that you would give to parents of, of a child with Down syndrome who's looking for some answers right now? Um, any key ideas you would? You know, I, I think, I think it's, you know, hiding in plain sight, you know what I mean? Like thyroid testing, mm -hmm. you know, is a big deal. Uh, and, and, and again, I still, to this day, uh, I'm not sure your experience, but I still deal with people around the world who are having a lot of resistance mm -hmm. to either even testing their child or bringing thyroid into optimal levels. I think that's tragic. Mm -hmm. So thyroid's important. You know, a, a baseline nutrient can't do everything. So, you know, a baseline nutrient is important, but already we've identified individual variations in choline, individual uh, dietary issues from the pre you know, from prebiotics, fiber intake, probiotics. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it looks, if it is, you know, it's, it looks like a duck, it's a duck. You know what I mean? It's the, the, if the child is constipated, gas and bloating, Food sensitivities, you know, food sensitivities absolutely are a symptom of a microbiome disturbance, right? It's, it's really that inflammatory process, behavioral, all these different things have different, you know, you can, you can deal with these things is sort of my advice, you know, so it starts from the gut, then you do your, you know, your base nutrients, and then you individualize based on testing, dietary intake, and, you know, the, and the science of the, of, of the lab, you know, and then you can, and you can go further, you know, like, you know, the individual genetic, I mean, I think one of the interesting, useful things about genetic testing is it doesn't change, you know, so many times I've got back to children's uh, genetic data and go, oh, look at this new data we have on this gene, you know, it's like one, you know, normally you have to test things over and over, we just right. go back and check that genome it's pretty cool yeah yeah so individuality right beyond just the extra chromosome yes. is going to create a lot of differences for a child and and i think acknowledging that if your child has a negative reaction to a nutrient to stop giving it and to figure out why and and you know maybe look a little bit deeper and and not just accept that your um, child has down syndrome therefore they need you know x uh nutrient uh -huh. Um, and if they have a negative reaction to that, then there's a reason, and then that should be. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, it, it's a big step moving forward. Is that sometimes I think the best thing for a health professional to say is, I don't know why you re you, know, you re reacted to this, and and to hold that up in the drug world. I deal with that so many times a day, where my doctor gave me this drug. And I had a reaction and I'm going, okay, well, there, well, there must be, he said, I never heard of that before. So I go, what, what are you saying? There's something wrong with you when right. you reacted to the drug that way. Right. I'm going, no, 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 no. First of all, that, that is a real reaction to the drug. And yeah. even if he hadn't heard of it before, that's not your problem. That's the patient. You can't blame you for your reaction. It's maybe he doesn't a better he doesn't understand the reaction, mm -hmm. and that if he will understand that reaction, maybe not now, but in the future, he will have more insight. But often by blaming the patient for a reaction, 
you you what you're doing is shutting down your 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 learning that's a big mistake so going to your point you know it's never weird that your child or somebody reacts to something it's normal for them and either you know what it means and i didn't trust me over i didn't know what any of it meant when i started 35 years ago right yeah. Either, but, but by saying, oh, no, no, I, I don't understand it, yeah. but maybe I'll figure it out eventually is, yeah. is sort of the, the best step. Right. But yeah. I never blamed the, I never blamed, you know, the parent for a, a weird reaction, you know? Right, right. You must have given it wrong or something. Yeah. Or like yeah, I, say, yeah. Um, I never heard of that before, right? Exactly. Yeah. A um, couple of things that there, what did I say? There can be no learning if we claim to have all the answers, right? We have to kind of always question why. Exactly. Um, and then well, I recently had a patient who I, I use antimicrobials a lot in my kiddos when there is SIBO or yeast overgrowth. Um, I use a formula called biocidin often. And I had a child who had a you know, negative reaction to it recently. And um, on his stool test, he had a lot of fat malabsorption and he had you know, symptoms of steatorrhea, which are greasy stools. And so I said, hold off. If he, if he had a negative, things got worse in his gut um, beyond what we would expect for die off. And so I said, well, let's stop it. You know, if he's having a negative reaction, let's stop it and let's do more testing. Let's ask for an ultrasound on his gallbladder. Let's figure out a little bit more of what's going on and not just, you know, well, I don't, you know, yeah, you, you I must have given it wrong or something. Yeah. But if you under, if you under uncover the issues in the, in the bile and, or in these things, then all of a sudden there's, there's a big upside to this. That's what's interesting about it. You're, you're finding out fundamental things that are changing the, the, the trajectory of that child's health forever. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Always looking deeper. So um, again, to kind of close up a little bit, where can people get a copy of your new book, Biology of the Brain? Uh, well, it's on Amazon, but I think, and we have it at, uh, at Nutrichem.com as well. Okay. And I've seen your, your website too, biologyofthebrain.com. I'll link all yeah, those bio here. Yeah, we haven't, sorry, thank you. <laughs> we, yeah. We're already moving on, right? Like, yeah, no, biologyofthebrain.com, yes. Wonderful, I'll link all those here for people. And um, how else can people get in touch with you if they want to work with you or find out about your work? Is it Nutricam.com? Nutricam.com, yep. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Well, thanks, Kent, for this time. I know that a lot of parents benefited, hopefully, from listening to this as well, and uh, we'll certainly be in touch. For sure. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Kent.